to start now. There might be some uh, further people um, joining us. Um, a slightly, uh, a slightly different tasting from what we're used to, but um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Miranda to start us off into. Uh, how to make it. Well, welcome to everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. Back to 1999. Um, absolutely cult followed whiskey that we are massive fans of here and for great reason as we'll touch on a lot tonight this is one whiskey that has really stood the test of time uh, it's just a handful of us here tonight uh, we're still waiting for a couple more but there's about 40 of us so as i said before please do feel free to switch on your microphone join the conversation sound off in the chat section if you'd like to any questions just fling them at us i would grab some water if you haven't already as this is a cast strength tasting and uh, prepare your whiskies because we'll just jump straight into it there's some multimedia that we'll be showing tonight, a couple of photos and a couple of short videos. And um, yeah, as, as I said before, please just don't hesitate to jump in if you'd like to ask any questions because there's just a couple of us here tonight. And, and Jules and I were super excited to be downstairs together for the first time doing a virtual tasting. So I've got companies, so I'm in a great mood. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, thanks to Miranda for um, keeping all the events going here. It's really been so um, important to, to keeping uh, the community alive and keeping the staff together here and, and just keeping the wheels turning in general. Such um, a yeah, I can tell you now the ice machines are already packed up. So, you know, some things have ground to a halt without use, but um, <laughs> the tastings will continue. That's for sure. Um, it's been a, uh, it's been a big couple of days for me. So this cask strength thing is absolutely nothing. It is, it's going to be super simple. I've spent the last two days um, judging um, as a part of the Australian Distilled Spirits Awards. So over the last um, two days, I've been through 78 Australian whiskies, which is a record um, <laughs> for the um, Australian Distilled Spirits Awards and any, um, any Australian um, awards at all, um, to have that many whiskey um, exhibits um, put on it in one year so you can see there on your screen uh, just how many samples I've had to deal with over the last um, couple of the de couple of days the last um, today was um, we went through I think it was about 15 or 20 different cask strength whiskies and I tell you what some of those cask strengths are getting up there like I reckon there was at least a couple of the 70s um, percentages Ooh. today so you really had to um, yeah prepare yourself Plenty of water. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, getting back to the uh, the Scotch um, single malt flavors is going to be really quite relaxing and quite quite um, quite fun. And I know exactly what I'm tasting, which is going to be um, really really nice. And uh, it's going to be great, even better to swallow something because I've just spent the last two days spitting everything out. So <laughs> finishing these off. Um, a special shout out to uh, a couple of people that are joining us tonight. Um, Paul Stapleton, thanks very much for uh, being here tonight. I know this isn't really your thing to do the, uh, the online tasting, so I really appreciate you joining in. Pleasure, Jules. Uh, also, thank you for um, helping us um, in supplying a couple of these bottles as well. Um, this tasting wouldn't have gone ahead if it weren't for um, some of your help um, in, in procuring these, so thanks very much. Um, also, um, we've got um, the, uh, the fantastic Graham Reich um, joining us tonight uh, from Adelaide. Um, I, I had no idea actually that, um, that Apple Arabuna was so important um, to, to, to Graham and to the odd whiskey company. Um, so yeah, Graham, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind just um, jumping in for a second and telling us um, what's, so, what's so special about um, Apple Arabuna and, and how it's shaped your, um, your place in the whiskey. Um, yeah, thanks, Jules. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, um, it's got a very, very soft spot for me, and it's um, to me, it's 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 massively important because back in the uh, late nineties, uh, I was working for a um, a retailer in in Adelaide, and we developed a, a whiskey portfolio, and we were starting to get a bit of bit of traction on that. And Orlando, in their infinite wisdom, had this new product arrive, which they didn't know what to do. And so they said, do you want exclusive on it? And we took one look at it and said, yes, please. And it was batch six, Avalar Abana. And we had Australian exclusive to it. So I think we sold a pallet within about a week and a half. And uh, we had, uh, and it, it basically created my career in, um, you know, in, in 
fine whiskey retailing and, and certainly put our company on, on, the, on, the bar, uh, on, the, on the board with it. So um, it was a wonderful time until they woke up and thought, hang on, we can do a bit better than this. And they took it away from us. But we had, we had um, a number of batches that went through us and uh, it, was, it was really exciting times. And it just hit the marketplace um, as something being really quite unique and quite special. And uh, Obviously, most people consumed it, but I was really quite surprised to see that uh, Jules was able to pick up a, a bottle of Batch 6. So, yeah, my, my career started on this whiskey, this exact whiskey. So, um, yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, please. Um, I, think, um, I think now's a, a pretty good time to, um, to, to hit that first dram. And, you know, sometimes I, I feel like uh, a lot of whiskey tastings um, like to build into their, you know, start at the, uh, the entry level or the youngest whiskey and work towards the most expensive one or the oldest one. Um, but I also find that my palate's, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit dulled by the end of it. And, um, you know, we may as well start with the, uh, with the, the pista resistance at the start. So please, uh, yeah, if you want to um, jump into that, <coughs> that uh, right now. May I just say, it was such a pleasure, ple pleasure watching Jules open his juice bag, even after tasting and having to, to nose and analyze 70 odd Aussie whiskeys. It was, a matter of milliseconds that he opened it was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it, there's something about uh, the way the, um, the Australian whiskies um, manage to display the sherry casks that they're, they're matured in. I think it's partly down to the, the size of the casks and the, uh, obviously the climate here, but um, the interaction of a, a Spanish Oloroso sherry cask in, uh, in uh, Spain or in uh, Scotland for that matter, sorry, um, and, and Australia is a totally different experience. So even if we get the exact same casks, they're gonna turn out differently. And it's, it's, it's really pleasant to get back to the familiar um, Scotch maturation um, after so many other um, iterations of, of uh, fortified casks. Can I just jump in there, Jules, and just say that in that era, uh, when this came out too, because the, the really big heavy hitters for, um, uh, single malts, you know, sherry single malts was obviously Macallan and, you know, and Glen Farkless and Glendronic were there, but um, Glendronic was, uh, I never thought was really that quite that good in that era. And then this guy came along and it looked clean, it looked sweet um, and, you know, had a bit of power behind it and, and at the time it was priced really quite remarkable. So it really gave, particularly Macallan, a, a real run for its money and just had a, you know, slight edge being, you know, that, that big car strength style. Big fruit cake. Definitely, definitely. And so I think, um, you know, you're dead right, Graham. And I think this, this whiskey really um, sets a huge tone and a great example for um, the next 20 years of, you know, what the definition of a sherry bomb is. Yeah. Well, we'll talk yeah, about too, too right, too right. Yeah. Um, I think the only other one which came close to it and... Um, um, Andrew Gerbidge uh, wrote a really great piece on it um, between Glen Farkless 105 and um, Abelour Abuna. They've really sort of managed to keep this incredible consistency um, in. Well, was, that, that's where that's where I would argue. I, I would I would argue against that because I think 105 was terribly inconsistent in those early years. Okay, well, there you go. Look, I haven't tried that many um, early uh, 105s. Um, yeah. But, um, you're dead right. Like just looking at these these now, um, the colour is incredibly consistent across mm. these six examples that we've got here, um, and I think we'll be able to judge throughout the uh, the next hour or so how consistent you know the last twenty years have been. Thank particular. So, um, getting back to um, this, the the origins of of, of Abelara Buna and. Oh. Bit about the, the distillery for those who um, might not know um, where where Abuna comes from. Um, Abuna, or how do other people say it? By the way, I was going to throw it out there. Over the years, having it ordered over the bar, um, you get all sorts of um, all sorts of pronunciations like Abunda, yeah, um, uh, Ab Abunad, Abunad, yeah. yeah. There was that video that I was telling you about that I watched today. It was uh, from ten years ago, and it was the the global ambassador for Abelau, and he was speaking on, I think it was uh, batch 24 that he was talking about at the time. And he said, Abuna, Abuna, there was no D at the end. And I've, I've held on to that because I heard the global ambassador say it, and now I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
it may, Abuna means uh, the origin. Um, and the reason that um, they've, they've, they've called it the origin is because um, when the distillery was um, rebuilt, um, sorry, when it was um, taken over by Perno Rickard in um, uh, 18, sorry, I'm getting stuck here. When they uh, re when they uh, when Perno took over in 1874, they um, they had some um, some more some works done on the on the distillery. And um, when the, the workers were, uh, were were pulling the place apart, they they they, they stole that, the new stills. That's what they were doing. Yeah, yeah they yeah. Uh, they found an old an old bottle wrapped in newspaper. And um, over lunch, they uh, they knocked over you know four fifths of it, and then took it to the boss and said, "Hey, what do you what do you think of this stuff? Is it you know we thought it was pretty good, uh, but we found it in the world might might be significant, might not be." And um, they they had it analysed and found. Um, that it dated back to um, 1826, um, after there had been a, uh, a fire at the distillery um, and burnt the place down and they had to start again. So this stuff, um, after they analysed it, they found that it was um, aged exclusively in sherry casks and from multiple sherry casks as well. This is the most important part. It wasn't just one cask of whiskey that had been, that had been bottled up. It was, um, it was multiple casks and they were all that European oak sherry um, origin. So this is, this is where the, uh, the, the, the guys at Perno really put together the story about um, Abuna and, and called it the origin. So um, th this is where the, the, the direction sort of um, started and, and it's how it's continued for the last 20 years. Always um, multiple casks, it was never a single cask um, offering. Um, and uh, always from those um, Oloroso sherry casks from Spain. Um, just um, having spent such a, a massive day um, analysing blindly um, massive sherry casks um, in, in the Australian scene, coming to this one, um, I, I do find that the, um, the nose is incredibly jammy. Um, it's what we look for in, in an Oloroso sherry cask, isn't it? That, mm. that raisins and strawberries and... Um, prune juice sort of character. Prunes and plums is a note that's come up in the comments as well. And butterscotch, you want to echo that as well. It's like such a classic tasting note, but it does ring so true for, for this whiskey. And I think it was, um, I've never forgotten this. I wish that I'd asked him a little bit more about it, but it was, it was Stuart Buchanan of Ben Rieck, Ben Glassow and Glendronic that once said, um, Oloroso really does just take care of the barley, just cradle the barley. Mm -hmm. And I think that he was alluding to the Pedro might kind of, you know, over overtake a lot of the grain characteristic, but that might be, not, not such a problem with the Oloroso. Well, it's a, it's a really great point because I find that um, Oloroso sherry on its own has a really lovely sort of yeasty nuttiness about it and, and malt whiskey spirit on its own, when it comes off the still, has that really um, nutty sort of full spicy um, creamy character about it. Mm. And so it makes sort of... Um, look after each other. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, if you get a really sort of sweet Pedro cask, the, the, the sweetness might sort of, um, you know, cover up those those nutty, oily elements of, of um, the barley and the you make. So um, that's probably really good exactly point. what he meant. Yeah, it <laughs> takes care of those original characteristics from the grain. Um, I do find on the palate, it's, it's really rather dry, um, really, really, really oaky. And by God, does it, does it hit you right at the back? The, the ABV. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit sad. It's a bit hollow on the palate as well. From uh, Yeah. The, 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 um, it, is, uh, it doesn't really sort of fill out in the, in the mid palate and give you that real sort of chewiness um, of, uh, of some malts. Um, but the sherry character really um, just goes straight down the middle and, and it's, it's quite almost... Um, uh, one dimensional in that fact that mm. you know you get the big fruits up front when it's on the palate it's really sweet and jammy and then on the, at the back of the palate that wood really sort of um, clinches the back palate. I'd be keen to hear uh, his thoughts on this one a touch of Maillard kind of thing going on like that toasty toasty note and mm. I think you've had some really good tasting notes of there before Lockie is this the earliest batch of the Abonar that you've tasted? Um, this would be the earliest batch I've tasted and for me it's Everything that Jules has said so far about the oily Oloroso character 
echoing that beautiful multi spirit, especially on your nose. Just fantastic. For me, I got a lot of like red earth and tartatan and uh, brandy butter, especially, which I, I always look for with Oloroso sherry cast. Um, but hot damn, this is a spicy whiskey on the palate. It is. It's got such a creamy nose too, doesn't it? Yeah. Disjointed in the best kind of way, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that's, that's an interesting point about the spice because you would probably take the presumption that this is, it actually is European oak, so it is Spanish oak, yeah. rather than the modern uh, derivations, which are all American oak. So you get that dry spiciness coming through on it. Wow. I, th I thought the finish, you know, just lingers on that, uh, all that dried, dried fruits as well, which is really, really quite pleasant, quite sweet. Yeah, almost like, um, uh, like clothes and, uh, and Christmas cake sort of baking. Yeah. 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 And to me, to me, that's old school sherry. It is old school sherry. Yeah. Um, and I were talking before about um, what the what the time in glass is potentially done for this um, this whiskey. And usually, I would have sort of um, thought that those tannins um, and that, that spiciness would have been something that's broken down um, over time in in glass. Um, but it seems to have just been something that sort of happened to the nose. Is that those those um, volatiles of the fifty nine percent or whatever we're at. Um, have, have sort of blown off quite considerably over time, but the um, the dryness um, is, is certainly still there. It hasn't hasn't let go at all, which is quite, kind of nice. Sometimes you get some of those whiskies that are 20, 30 years old, and and uh, there's no back palate left on them at all. Um, I'd like to um, think about what other whiskies were in the process of being created um, when this whiskey was released. Um, so, for instance, um, in, uh, in 1999 or 2000, um, when this particular bottling came out, um, the, uh, the very first of the, uh, the Hartwood whiskies were, uh, were being conceived. So, uh, some of you might remember uh, the uh, Hartwood. <laughs> oh, boy, you got one. <laughs> this was the year um, that, that it was, in fact, um, distilled um, when this whiskey was brought out, which I found uh, really rather uh, endearing. And uh, I was talking to, to Tim Duckett about that and he said, yep, we were, we were right at the start of our journey in, uh, in 1999. And uh, yeah, he was still um, working really closely with Bill Lark on what was at the time just uh, you know, a, a project, um, mm. a fun project. And now look at what it's turned into. Um, so yeah, I just thought this would be interesting to sort of set the tone about where other people were at. And it makes me wonder whether, and I'm sure Tim Duckett would have tried Avalara Buna and gone, wow, Ooh, yeah. I love that stuff. How influential was Batch 6 to the production of things like The Beast, uh, Release The Beast and uh, other Heartwood whiskies? I think it's really influenced, um, influenced him a lot. Um, and uh, it pro in, that, in that respect, it's probably influenced the whole of the Australian whiskey producing industry as well a lot because so many Australian whiskey producers now aspire to be this, this type of whiskey. Mm. Highly, highly alcoholic, highly sherry and highly, um, highly aggressive and intense on the palate as well. So, um, yeah, an interesting point to... to to, to start off on. I'm actually going to move on to um, the second whiskey now um, because I, I really like to come back um, at the end of all of this and, and sort of see how batch six um, stands up after we've tried batch 66. So if you'd like to jump into, um, into batch 20, uh, glass number two, the, uh, the nose, uh, is, uh, is, is, is far more restrained in the, um, in the, the fruit character. There's not that really concentrated uh, red skins and, um, and plum jams characters. This is a little bit more nuanced. I, I, I find it to be almost coming up on uh, roasted peppers. Um, There's a load of oak in there as well. Spicier on the nose, John is saying. Spicier on the nose for sure. Mm. Um, this one, 
We've come in at a, a hot uh, 60.5%. I'll hold that one up for the camera. Yeah, buddy. Oh, the focus on that's perfect. <laughs> really, uh, I love the, these old labels and uh, we'll talk some more about the labels uh, later on and, uh, and how, they've, um, how they've changed. Yeah, I'm sorry about the, the typo there. The baggy says 66, Tasty Matt says 67. What could we... Wait, which one was this for, sorry? Oh, we're on batch 20. 60.5%. Oh, you're talking about the last whiskey? Um, Moors, I think. The, so, last, the last whiskey is 66, sorry, to answer the question in the comments there. Um, getting back to um, the second glass, um, the second um, whiskey, Batch 20, was bottled in 2011. So between the year 2000 and, um, and 2007, um, we went through 20 batches. So that's about two, two batches um, a year, which tends to accelerate um, as the years go on. I think in, um, yeah, batch seven, eight, and nine were also created in the year 2000. Um, and then um, by the time we get to, yeah, 2007, we're onto batch 20. So um, I, I found some other tasting notes from, um, from batch 20 that were taken back in, uh, in 2007. And it says um, buckets of cash. Herbal, mint, and chlorophyll. Ooh. I have to. Uh, I have to really agree with the herbal yeah, elements of this one. Yeah, as soon as you said it, the mint as well. Yeah, minty, raisins, all that sort of stuff. Totally. That's cool. Um, talking about the labels, how little um, the the labels have haven't changed actually um, on the Abuna for over the last twenty years. Um, we're going to get up some um, some labels here from other whiskies that were bottled in uh, in 2007. Uh, this is Bamor Darkest as it was in 2007. Uh, a completely different. It looks like it was bottled tw like 100 years ago, mm. if you ask me. Um, and then what have we got next there? We've got. Sorry, I'm not going to be that quick. <laughs> That's all right. No problem. Um, We've got the Farkless Ockentoshan was a good one. Yeah, the Ockentoshan 3 Wood, um, bottled in 2007. Looks uh, medieval. How's that? <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Medieval's a perfect word for that. <laughs> um, if, if anyone's tried those um, Ockentoshan 3 Woods from that era, they actually do have some substance to them, uh, which, is, which is nice in comparison to the more recent style. And, um, and Glen Farkless, well, they were, they were probably stuck in the 90s a little bit with their labelling. Um, but they'll, they'll catch up over time with the, uh, with the 105, which has had a huge amount of variation in, uh, in labelling over, over the years. Um, it's almost like a pinstripe thing going on with that label, isn't it? <laughs> that's the way it's described, actually, is that oh, it's really? the pinstripe 105, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, we've also got um, the Glendronic 15. Uh, there, there's an old favourite. Yeah. <laughs> 2007, Graham, it's not that long ago, mate. Yeah, yeah, they used to, oh, well, in the early days, they used to stink of sulfur, those guys. They used to use shit casks. <laughs> oh, they're just dreadful. I haven't cracked it yet. Oh, no. <laughs> they were a different era, very much a different era. There you go. Uh, sorry, sorry, excuse my language. That's just technical talk out of the trade. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And uh, our, our mate Bill Lark, he says uh, if, he's, if he's sussing out a few different casts and he really likes when he says, oh, it's not too shit house. <laughs> <laughs> His favourite? Wouldn't spit that out. Wouldn't spit that out, yeah. <laughs> um, so here's another one from, uh, from 2007. This is the Glen Morangi Portwood finish, which later became um, the, uh, the Quinta Reuben. Um, which we uh, know quite well now. So that's actually another one of these um, whiskies that stood the test of time. Um, and, um, you know, no doubt changed over the years. But at the time, um, Glenmorangie Portwood finish was, um, was quite, 
experimental mm. to be um, to be transferring between casts. So um, it's, it's amazing how far we've come in in you know a short period of time. And Oops. the way that the uh, the labelings changed on that Glamorangi is quite profound. <laughs> it really is. There was a question in here from Michael. Any idea with the age on these first two? There was never any ages um, released on these. I've seen varying reports that say, you know, for anywhere from 12 up to 30 years old on these whiskies. But um, my, my, my tendency is to, is to say that they're from a pretty narrow band of, of, um, of ages. Mm. Um, and I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to hazard the guess, but um, yeah, I think it doesn't really grab me as though there's any really, really old stuff in here. And I don't think, I don't think there ever has been. The, the, I think the um, the great thing about this and is is that the, from my understanding that is that the price point has always been pretty pretty entry level, uh, and the fact that it's never borne an age statement probably was a little bit risque at the time and um, and a way that they um, sort of um, broached the topic of um, you know it's all about the cask and not so much about the age and that would have been difficult for a lot of people to sort of you know put a mark of quality on um, because age was so important for so long. The guys at Glenlivet were, were touting it and, until 2007, if not even later, that, that age was everything yeah. um, on, a, on, a, on a bottle of whiskey. But, um, you know. I'll just, I just pop in that a lot of my customers in those early days were buying it because it had high alcohol. <laughs> Didn't care about the age. <laughs> there you go. Bang, uh, bang for your buck. I'm just going to say too, that 20... Uh, you get this really, it's, it's now drying, drying out and it's getting very oaky on the back of the palate. Mm. It is, yeah. yeah. Drying, drying oak, you know. Yeah, shame really. I'm, I'm wondering when um, we're going to get this um, change in, um, in oak character coming through on these whiskies because I'm, I'm going to have a bit of a guess here and say that there's going to be a switch to uh, American oak coming up very shortly. I have, actually haven't been through these to check, so it, it yeah. might... The, 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 the trick there is to see whether, where you go from those dried fruits, so you get the, those dried sherry uh, notes and a bit of furniture polish and um, you know, those sorts of notes, and you start getting fresh fruit flavours. Yeah, and I think also some of those more biscuity um, characters. Characters, yep. Um, yeah, and of course you get, you, you get more of the uh, uh, cream caramel, um, coconut, vanilla sort of character coming through as well. Yeah. It's sweeter. Uh, ice cream cones and uh, and what, uh, all, all sorts of American oak, um, um, you know, touching points. So it'll be interesting to come back and or, or see when the change comes about. Yeah, if you really want to test it, just go buy some Macallans, eighteen-year-olds from the you know vintage dated around about nineteen eighty-five, and that's when the swap over occurred, and uh, you can really tell the difference. Really, uh -huh. the mark. <laughs> uh, that was me just showing off, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, Graham has asked uh, if the key distillery staff have changed over the years. I can say that I watched an interview today, and there was a distiller talking that started at Abla in two thousand and two. I know that they have got new distillers that have started on. I'm not sure if their master distillers changed. Do you know, Jules? Um, I, I don't know. I I know that the um the blender at the time was reasonably new when um when um. Uh, Abuna um, was first made. Um, it was um, David Boyd that was the the master uh, master blender when when the first ones came out, um, and he worked with Paul Hicks, who was um, running the marketing at the time for uh, for Perno Ricard. So, um, apart from I don't know whether the the distillers have changed. Um, I dare say they probably have. Yeah, um, I think they have. Yeah. yeah. You just need to be a bit careful with that because in that era, distillers, all they did was distill. So, you know, they were, they were production managers making ethanol. This is so it was, it was down to the guys that were doing the blending and the marketing department that came up with this sort of stuff. 100%. Yeah, yeah. great point. Yeah. Um, I'm going to um, move on to, uh, to batch 39 now. Last number three in our um, lineup tonight. I'm gonna come back to um, come back to batch twenty in all its herbal oaky goodness. Now the the tasting notes for thirty nine that I read that, that came out 
in 2012, um, and these are from Serge. Um, he said um, pine wood, mocha, and black currant, which and bitter orange, uh, oak spice throughout, and finishes with bitter chocolate and cardamom. It'd be interesting to see because black currant for me is is more of that sort of um, American oak cask, American oak um, timber uh, sherry cask um, note. Um, although he does talk about um, those uh, oak spices still being quite prominent. So perhaps we'll see a, a little change here. I'm, I'm with Benson as well in the comments there who called bright tropical fruit. That's, that was my first, yeah. first approach to the glass. I, I got some pineapple. I tell you what, it's a cracker of a drink though. The balance is just beautiful. Yeah, I have to agree. The body and the mid palette on this is so much broader. I think that might be my favourite so far. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I probably reckon you're right, actually. <laughs> yeah, the complexity is um, just completely different. Don't you think? <laughs> Graham, you're all on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you don't like that one, Graham? <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> you like the really zingy oak on the, on the back palette, mate. <laughs> okay, okay. No problem. Shall we look at some... Uh, some some bottlings from uh, what, what year we got here, 2011? Yeah, so 2011 um, was when um, Sherry Jean was becoming uh, more of a whiskey bar. Um, and uh, some of the bottles that came out in uh, 2012, this was the uh, Ardbeg Day release, the first of the Ardbeg Days. Um, so that was one of the releases that came out then. Uh, another cult classic that's continued since then. Mm -hmm. um, we've also got some... Um, when we get up to it, what's coming up next? The Lark bottling. Um, so this is what Lark single malts looked like in 2011. Um, doesn't, that, isn't, doesn't that look like a, uh, an age and a half ago? Um, when they were all hand signed by Christy. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really interesting. That was the year that um, I first went down and uh, visited uh, the Lark Distillery in 2011. Uh, oh, the first staff trip, was it? Oh, no. The that first, was first staff trip. trip, yeah, I suppose you could call it that. Yeah. Um, uh, a really interesting time. Um, when you could just um, find Bill Lark's phone call, phone number, and uh, all the brochures. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> then here we how, go. How things have changed. Graham might have a word or two to say about this one. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's really old. Hey. Right, this 2011, maybe it's not that old. Yeah, no, I suppose not, no. You've sold bottles like that to me over the years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that would have been the old, uh, was it the green box? Was it? No, not the green box, I can't remember. Yeah. It, no, it wasn't a green box. I think it was a black box, but... Um, black, oh, black box with the writing over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm sure some of us have got fond memories of some of these uh, older labels. Um, and this is when... Um, this is when the first of the, uh, the, the sorry, I'll stop sharing. You're right. This is when the first of the uh, what we would call the semi-modern um, labels came into use. Um, this one. I think there were probably some other batches that, that carried um, this label as well, but um, interesting to see how long that really managed for. Managed for about um, seven years um, on that particular label. Mm. Interesting stuff, interesting stuff. Pineapple lumps, blackberry, hot cinnamon, donuts, hot, hot cinnamon donuts on the nose. Lovely tasting notes there from Lockie. And a nice sweet waxy finish. I've got to agree with the, the waxiness is something that has carried through. Yeah. Like we had it on the nose in the first one, I reckon. And now we've got it on the palate in the third. Man, the, the sherry difference on the first and the third was is, is so profound. Yeah. It's, um, it's, fresh, fresh, um, uh, freshly poured PX almost. I know it's not a PX cast, but it, it's so jammy on the first one. And then when we get to, um, to batch 39, it's all complex and tight and, you know, licorice, all sorts, sorts of character mm. um, to it on the nose. And yeah, waxy as well. That, that sort good. of like crayons out of the pencil case character. So we've got a little, just, uh, it's, it's pretty fluffy, but it's just a distillery video that um, a channel called Whiskey Tips uploaded onto YouTube. And I just thought that this would make a nice little intermission video for us, because we're on to our third whiskey now. 
uh, about halfway through the tasting, if anybody would like to go grab some water, take a bathroom break, we're just going to watch a quick video. It just goes for three minutes there. So you've got a nice chance to just check in with anybody you need to. Ready, Jules? Go for it. Yep. And as I said, it is very fluffy. <laughs> Basically, as the as the alcohol evaporates, um, it sort of sticks to uh, things around distilleries. It's even been known to um, get onto trees as well. Some of the Ooh. trees in in America um, near like Jim Beam warehouses get this black mold growing on them as well. Um, oh, wow. And um, surrounding houses have been uh, have also complained that they're you know been um, covered in this black mold from the uh, maturing whiskey around the place. So. That's what that is, if you didn't know. That's cool, yeah. Shall we finish it? Yep. <laughs> seen this before I think it's, it's um, probably a uh, unique element to all the distilleries in Scotland um, Abelau has these um, massive um, piles of rocks is the only way I can describe them um, that are held up by these um, what look like big long staves and they tr they used to trickle the water through it in order to um, purify it on its way into the distillery I don't know whether they still use it um, but um, does it say it does but, um, I'm not sure. This was shot 2016 and it seems to be all happening. There seems to be water. Um, so, yeah, a really interesting one. I, I've never seen that before. Um, there you go. Carry yeah. on.
just a little insight into Abla. Do you mind that actually? Uh, I love uh, I love a bit of the pipes on a. Oh yeah. Good I think stuff. I think a uh, bagpipe goes in your ear and out your eye. Thank you, Dom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, lovely. Um, Simon So says, I remember those cooling towers. They did when we were there, August 2015. Cool. Is that where they are? Cool. There were a, a few more whiskeys that came out in, uh, where were we? In, uh, 2000 and, uh, in 2012 as well. Um, Brooklady bottled um, the first of their Flatty Classics in, in 2012. And... Um, the Wolfburn Distillery was um, was purchased. Uh, the land for the Wolfburn Distillery was purchased in 2012. So you know, since this whiskey was uh, bottled, whole new ventures have been conceived and matured, essentially, which is uh, is pretty monumental. And yet, they're still making the exact same product. Uh, I reckon there'd be a, a bunch of new distilleries out there now that would give their IT to have something that you know was so well followed and easily produced on a large scale consistently time after time um like a booner is so it's, uh, it's, it's pretty monumental actually mm. um so i'm going to move on to um batch 45 which is glass four now sorry for not giving you guys a headphone warnings as well i think a few people got some bad audio there sorry about that <laughs> bless the national broadband network <laughs> Amazing work they're doing. Um, so on the nose with um, batch 45. A little bit more closed to this one. I actually want to warm it up a little bit. It's um, all that sort of um, orange oils uh, in, in this one. What ABV are we at? So we're at 60.2% and we're jumping three years from our previous batch. Okay. That was another good thing we were speaking about before, the jumps in batches. They were so big sometimes. And then you get, you know, like we're tasting batches just three years apart, but the previous ones were probably eight years. And then, you know, it's amazing how consistent it actually has managed to stay through the 30 years, like, and through all the batches and through distillery staff changes and, and yeah. different cask regimes. Like it, they are also wildly different, but when you get down to the bones of it, I think it's really is amazing how consistent it is. Yeah, totally. I mean, we're, we're looking at minute differences here really across some, um, across the batches. Um, I'm still finding it a little hard to get more out of the nose of this. So I'm just going to dive in there and have a taste. We've got Graham with caramel shortbread plums and cherries. Oh, this is getting into, certainly we've changed. Definitely. The sherry is a completely different pr profile now. It's much more whiny and um, fresh, um, less of that sort of, reduced fortified character really really interesting the way it's um jumped in, in characteristic and I, I dare say you know what graham was talking about before um the way that the um the really spicy um furniture polish type of oak um is is, is not the, the main feature of the back palette anymore now it's about the heat um and the uh the spirit profile that's that's finishing off the back of the palette and the yeah you have to, you have to say i'll just jump in there is that the palate structure is actually getting better over time? Hundred percent. It's yeah, you know that uh, the um, I mean that the, those early ones are a little bit rough and ready around the edges. I mean that's their charm, you know that, that roughness. But these these guys are starting to get quite you know quite sophisticated and quite quite balanced in that regard. Yeah, certainly. I think if there were um, you know two main flavors from batch six, you know they were you know uh, jam and uh, and dry splintery oak. Yeah. Um, polish. Whereas here we're looking at all sorts of, um, you know, fresh grapes. We're looking at dried fruit. We're looking at yeasty characters from the from the barley. We're looking at, you know, um, that sort of developed caramel character. It's um, and don't, don't forget, there's a nice big malt content in these later ones as well. And, and like caramel content for me comes from comes from that malty. Um, and then we do get a, a little bit of that um, dryness and that 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 um, furniture polish character from the timber, but that um, waxy character that I was talking about and beeswax was spoken about in the chat as well. I feel like that's gone. It might might come up with a little bit of time in the glass though. Mm, yeah, it could do, and, and maybe even a little bit of water might sort of um, help bring that out too. 
Um, well, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> Putting water in it. Yeah. You know, Miranda might play the video later on, um, but there's uh, there's a video from Abelawa and they're putting ice cubes in it. Mm. Like the full on Abelawa promotional video with ice cubes. I was like, God, don't let Rick say that one. No. <laughs> With a bloody lot at you. Yeah, uh, Jules, getting back, sorry, getting back to your earlier comment about being in glass for, you know, for, for a very long time, you know, actually aging in the, in the bottle. This, this could be a, a, an indication of that as well. Certainly is, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's, this, there's something to be said for the, um, for the organic components uh, of whiskey and how they simply break down um, over, over time. And um, perhaps, you know, the, the multi um, body and the, the fresh grapey characters that we're talking about um, on, on, on this whiskey now, the 45, um, how that's you know completely different um, on the uh, on the batch six because they've just simply broken down over time. I mean, it would, that, that's why I really sort of um, particularly with batch twenty uh, went to Serge's um, Serge's tasting notes because he he tasted it in two thousand and seven, and for us to then compare the tasting notes from two thousand and seven now, okay. after, uh, a really good uh, sort of gauge of of, of how the how it's broken down in the, in the bottle over time. Definitely. And I'd like to say, uh, echo Alex's comment. It was a fantastic comment. Side by side with batches across a long, long time period are amazing because we're picking them apart. But I wonder if you poured these two years apart, would you even remember the subtle differences, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah. I have to agree there. And, you know, this is the, the beauty of the way that um, consumers are actually uh, adapting um, really quite quickly, our, our palates need to be um, tantalised. You know, you, you're not going to keep going and buying the same whiskey if you're not um, excited by it. Mm. Um, so it needs to evolve. It needs to keep getting better um, as time goes on in order to, uh, in order to you know, keep your attention, I suppose. Yeah, unless, Absolutely. Yeah, otherwise it's a different sort of drinker, isn't it? Mm, really, really cool. Um, I, the, the fresh wine character for me is something that, I, I don't get on whiskies that were bottled um, in 2013. It wasn't something that I really noticed um, then. Uh, and we were, you know, tasting extensively at the time. And I, I don't really remember that, that fresh um, grapey wine character being so prominent at the time. But maybe I've become more attuned to it over the last um, few years. Mm. Really, really. Well, you, well you, no, you do have a contrast from those, those almost those first two to this, so that it highlights that. You're right. Having something to compare to is um yeah, too, yeah, because norm, normally we taste in isolation, so you know with these sort of things. Yeah, yeah. And Alex, that that wine character could definitely be the acid that you're picking up, the bright, the the yeah, a bright white character of a white wine for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Um, and slowberry vibes, Sam, agreed. Yeah, agreed. Mm, slowberry. That's such a great point. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a, a little bit more acidic yeah. than, um, than some of the others, which were, were more about, you know, A, timber, but B, about the savouriness of them as well. Yeah. Mm. Um, interesting that we've been managing to pick up that level of, um, of fruit and freshness uh, out of this distillate on, just on batch 45, because... Um, just um, having a look at the still shape at at, um, at Abelawa, they're really um, not particularly tall and long and slender. Um, you know, they're very fat and uh, onion shaped sort of styles of still that are, you know are designed to produce that heavier, um, more sort of savoury style of spirit. Let a bit more of that sort of um, volatile through. Um, yeah, yeah so short dumpy boys, weren't they? Yeah. Short dumpy boys, that's for sure. <laughs> As opposed to the long and slender girls of uh, Glen Morangie. That's it. Yes. Very good. Um, let's move on to, um, to batch 50. Which one are we on to? Batch 54. Yes. 16. Keep up. Keep up. <laughs> Cheeky. Too many, uh, too many notes going on here, mate. I've got to, got to find it through all the, uh, all the stuff. <laughs> ah. So, batch 54, we're on to 2016. Nine batches in three years, so three batches a year. 
Hey, Benson, if you'd like, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Feel free. It goes for everybody. Uh, I, was, I was just typing in there. I was just asking, you know, Oloroso is a wine, sherry. Right. Um, and we talk about 20 years of, of whiskey making. How has Oloroso sherry changed through those 20 years? I thought you'd never ask. This is one of my favourite topics. <laughs> so please feel free to, uh, to cut me off if, uh, if, we, if we go on about the uh, the production of Oloroso sherry too much. Um, but um, uh, the uh, the uh, the Solera system of, of Oloroso sherry is um, it has changed over the years. There's there's no doubt about that. Um, so basically, um, imagine a, a row of tasks. Um, and they're all filled at the same time initially um, with uh, with a wine, and uh, the fermentation also takes place in the in the casks as well. Now, every three months, what they do is they'll they'll take out a certain uh, number of jugs of uh, of that wine from each cask and put them in a trough, right? So they're blending them um, from from day from day dot essentially. So all of those all of those casks will taste, you know pretty much exactly the same. Um, how the timber develops is, is a little bit different, but um, yeah, all the wine's the same. And then every year, they'll continue to, to be um, redistributing and blending the, the wines um, that all of these um, casks in the row have. Now, um, over the years, that, that, that age gets um, older and older and older. So all these casks are maturing with the same wine in them at the same rate and they're constantly being blended so that they all taste exactly the same. They're like one huge batch that evolves over time together. Um, so the thing is, um, as sherry has become um, less sought after and um, you know, the, the casks have become more and more of a commodity, um, those, those rows of casks, what we call a criadera, um, hasn't spent so long um, maturing um, the, the sherry. So they can become Olorosos after just a matter of, of, of a few years, uh, all the way up to 30 years old, these, these criaderas, um, the row of casks. Um, and um, I think that the, the demand for really high value sherry um, has, has, has dropped really, really dramatically. Um, I bought the most expensive bottle of sherry I've ever bought a while ago and to be honest, pretty much I've ever seen um, on a current market, I'm not talking about auction markets. Uh, and it was 120 euro and it was the most expensive sherry that they had at the, at the, uh, at the, at the bodega. And uh, when we said, oh, can we have two of those? And the guy looked at us like, are you crazy? You want to buy two of these bottles? These are, these are insanely expensive. And we're like, yeah, yeah. Like this is, this is great stuff. I've spent $200 on a bottle of wine before. Why? Why not spend two hundred dollars in a bottle of sherry? Absolutely. Um, so the fact that those sorts of products are in in minute demand, no, you know, very very few people are willing to pay that sort of dollar um, for for thirty year old sherry. So therefore, the criaderas of thirty year old sherry aren't there either, um, and uh, that's probably what's changed so much about the sherry industry. Yes, demand has has dropped, and Oloroso casks are in lower supply but they're also changing in their profile as well but yeah can i can i just jump in there too because the you nobody's nobody's drinking it and basically i think the scottish whiskey industry is keeping them afloat but they're keeping them afloat with american oak casks mm. for most of your stock standard sherry malts these days it's american oak it's probably ex-bourbon barrels that they send down to Hareth they pour some of the cheapest, nastiest sherries into them, swirl them around, send them back to Scotland, tip them out, and then they put uh, whiskey into it, and then they call it a sherry whiskey. I mean, yeah, we can do the, the made-to-order season casks where Jules was, was teaching, like, probably told me this a year ago, that it's, it's quite like putting on a, an, in an online order for a meal. You can pick your wood, you can pick how many months you want it season for. You can pick the exactly, time. exactly right. And Alex has, has uh, just sounded off in the comment section here who's just wondering, um, the, the sherry, was this a product or component for the actual product, the cask? And I think this lends to the discussion of, you know, when did seasoning sherry casks really start to happen and when 
when did the use of genuine like Solera casks kind of trail off? Was that, and like, how does that relate to our first batch here in 99? How does that timeline meet up? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I think that the, um, the seasoning of sherry casks um, actually has an incredibly long history. Um, mm. However, uh, it dates all the way back to um, Johnny Walker, um, Johnny Walker's early, early um, blends. He actually has a recipe um, in his diary about how to uh, accelerate a cask. Um, <laughs> I was hoping you were going to mention that. <laughs> that's how seasoning begun, essentially, until it was uh, outlawed um, in the 1980s. And I dare say that the seasoning as we know it started straight after that. Um, as soon as Paxarit was was disallowed, um, for, for those of you who aren't um, familiar with Paxarit, um, Paxarit or Pax for short was actually the name of a of a, a region um, or a, or a or a house um, hundreds of years ago, and the wine was highly sought after. It was a it was a sherry um, type of wine, um, and um, as as um, the popularity of it grew. Um, the, there were no um, quality assurances and no, um, no ways of, of um, really protecting the brand. So cheaper um, brands of Paxarette, as they were labelled, um, were, were produced and it really destroyed um, the good name of, 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 of what was a fantastic wine to begin with, potentially. So um, Paxarette... Basically, basically it's, it's, de it's dehydrated sherry. Mm. Yeah. That's um, what it is. Great, great must um, made into glue and then pasted on the inside of a cask. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, I've, 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 I'm sorry being a pain, but uh, again, getting back to Macallan, 18 year olds, try an 84, 18 year old, that had packs, try an 85, it didn't. Yeah, and they're totally. Don't go there. Yeah, uh, essentially, like the, um, the, the packs are at, was like, you know, glue on the inside of the cask made out of sugar. Yeah. And um, and the 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 um the spirit would just dissolve it straight away. <laughs> and Alex almost... Carter says sugary sherry syrup. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It. That's so, uh, yeah, a completely different um, time. And um, after that, I would say that that's when the um the, the modern seasoning um, began, which is a different different process altogether. Um, really. So yeah, where where you know lower quality sherries are filled into the cask, um, perhaps not even full. Um, yeah, is is the way that we've heard it. They're, um, forced into the pores of the wood with air pressure. In some cases, in some yeah, cases? yeah, that's what that was one of Johnny Walker's recipes oh. um, was to was to um, force it into the wood with air pressure. But you know, look, it's when you go to Spain and ask the sherry bodegas, do they do they um, sell any of their casks to, to the Scottish whiskey industry? They just look the other way. Um, it's not something they want to talk about. Um, yeah, and they're not they're really not proud of it, and they just want to talk about their wine. Um, which is really, really interesting. Um, even um, Emmanuel Dron um, of the Old Alliance in Singapore and a few other um, blokes like um, Geert Biro, um, who's the, known to be the biggest Udbeg collector in the world, um, they went on a sort of a fact-finding mission throughout uh, Hareth um, and really knocked on a lot of doors to find out more about these casks and where they were or weren't coming from. And it, it really is like a... They're almost like sherry cask sweatshops you know the yeah, way they yeah. produce them yeah <laughs> that's one way to, wow that's it that creates a visual yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> for sure um so yeah i'd love to get some um some feedback on what people think about um about batch 45 mm. 55 um, quickly say alex they did some the solera casks were sometimes used but it's very far and few in between um there was one that we had a tasting here for last year the Aaron Master of Distillery, which was a Palo Cortado, which was a genuine Bodega Solera system cask that was used, but it's, yeah, it's not that common anymore. Mm. Yeah, I think. I found, it, I found it really quite lean. It's starting to get a bit mean at the moment. Mm. Batch 45, a bit, a bit lean. Lean, lean and mean, yeah. It hasn't quite got the, um, the, the multi body that um, perhaps some of the other ones did, and it is a bit more sort of sharp and and uh, oaky and furniture polished, so the character coming through um, as opposed to the others. So yeah, it's really picked up the timber on, on this occasion. 
Very, very interesting. Mm. Mm. Any other um, any other input on uh, how you find the progression uh, into uh, into forty five? Is it is it more about more of the way you first remember Abalara Bruna? Because so many people, um, you know, their first sort of love for for big um, sherry bombs and or sherry monsters was on a Bruna. That's how they got hooked on the style. Has it has your uh, opinion changed of this whiskey? Is it still giving you in these later batches um, that sherry bomb hit that you remember? I'll 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 jump in here and say that the first time I tried Abalawa Abana was probably two thousand and twelve. Um, so around the same time as batch thirty nine. Um, and I fell in love with this whiskey and then I moved to Melbourne in 2013 and I was drinking this whiskey at the bar at Whiskey and Ailman from 2013 to 2015. And I absolutely loved it. And I very quickly changed my tune when it came to, I think it was batch 49. It just really ruined it for me. And I found that there wasn't the complexity I was looking for in the whiskey anymore. There was in that molten cast balance that I found in those middle, those uh, batch 39 to 45 that we've just tasted. And now we're on batch 54 and there's still not that real balance of spirit and um, cask. I wonder whether glass would, um, more time on glass would change that. A little bit of, a little bit of old bottle effect. Just thinking that. I, I would love to yeah. you know, have a recording of this session and then to all meet up in five years with the same lineup and, and do the same recording <laughs> with that different tasting note. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be there. We are recording it, Graham, so we'll hold you to it, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Only recently into the Abalua, and my first experience was a 63. Michael, how, how did you feel about the 63 when you first tasted it? And now, how has this been for you tasting back to batch six? Look, the, the 63 for me was, um, was uh, quite strong to begin with because I hadn't experienced it before. Um, uh, I had to water it down just a touch um, to to actually get any uh, anything out of it, um, but this this range here has just been uh, uh, pretty amazing. Um, the forty five for me is probably uh, the pick of the bunch so far. Um, it's a lot more um, fruity. Uh, it uh, just sits on the palate really well. Um, uh, yeah, just uh, just really amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, it was like really. Um, kind of flip of to brightness that we got when it came to glass number four, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a, a really distinct change and um, something that I really enjoyed, actually. The complexity just leapt up um, a huge amount. Totally. Mm. Um, I'm just having a, a quick look back through um, some of the other um, ones we've tried tonight. Now, before we uh, go on to the last one, I'd encourage you to do the same because it's uh, incredible to see how how your uh, opinion of these drams really changes um, over the course of uh, the night. That first one just, I mean, yes, it says Oloroso Sherry Cask, but geez, it smells of PX. I tell you what, mm. it's so grapey. Um, and then we, uh, we look at the Crash 20 and it's um, more savoury and um, more of what I would akin to that sort of yeasty, um, savoury uh, Oloroso style. Interesting. I'm actually like on glass five, having sat for a second, getting for the first time tonight, a little bit of sunscreen. A bit of sunscreen? A little bit of sunscreen, mate. Yeah, yeah, it has got that coconutty character, mm. which would allude to American oak, but yeah, I have to agree with you. Good point. That's cool. All that, and it's got a bit of that waxiness too, actually. Oh, it's coming out. Mm, mm. Well, it's still so herbal. I would like to um, to move on to our, our last um, batch for the night, the um, 60. Can we watch a little, a little video first? Yeah, ready? let's watch a little video before we get onto it. Let's do it. Just give me a sec to set it up. Oh, 
of a Lowers a very special place. It makes probably the finest malt whiskey on Speyside. <laughs> the distillery has been here for a long, long time, and Aberlour was a pioneer many years ago of sherry matured whiskies. The secret is really the double cast maturation. This means that we're taking some whiskey which has been matured for the entire period in the American oak cast, and whiskey that's been matured for its entire period in the sherry cast from Spain, and then we combine the two to get the perfect balance of flavours. Making good whiskey takes time. It takes time for the spirit to integrate with the sherry flavours and certainly talks to the quality of the artisanal crafted spirit that we produce. And then, of course, the pinnacle of that is Abuna Abuna. Abuna is different in several ways. It's a cash strength and it's bottled at natural strength. We only make so many batches and each batch can be very subtly different. This is the ultimate cult whiskey, which inspires anyone who's ever tasted it to become an instant aficionado. And I do hope that we've um, bred the instant aficionado <laughs> in you this evening of Abulawa Abuna. <laughs> Thank you and good night. No, um, we're not finished yet, guys. Um, that was, there, was, uh, there was some sweeping claims there. There was. Um, the pioneers of sherry cast. Mm. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, in interesting, interesting, yeah. Um, the, the, the one thing I did enjoy about that actually was um, David Boyd was in there. Um, David Boyd being the guy that, um, that did the first blend, um, the first batch, sorry, of Ab Abelara Buna back in uh, late 1999. So, uh, and that looks like a reasonably recent uh, recording as well. So, yeah. looks like he's still there and he's. He's probably been doing it the whole time, which you know, lends to the uh, development of the, uh, of the batches over time. Um, all right, so if, if everyone's ready, well, I think we can get on to our final batch of Abuna for tonight. Um, this is batch 66. We've gone the full way from batch 6 to batch 66. Is it, is it 66? It is. It's just 67 on your tasting mat. That's a little uh, typo. It's oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Six on your little baggie as well, as well there. So the baggie and um, and uh, the bottles that are being held up are the correct ones. Yes, it was my mistake. I'm very sorry. <laughs> now, oh no, 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 no. That's fine. No, that's fine. What have you sent there, David? There's a picture that's just gone into the chat. You might be on mute, mate. It's got batch seven happening now. Batch seven, oh, it's a picture of batch seven. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, it's my, it was my first taste of Avalor. My father's Avalor, and we uh, unfortunately uh, had a little accident with the cork. But other than that, very good. Hello, David and David Senior. Thanks for joining us. Yep. Uh, we also had um, some, some sticky corks in, uh, in a couple of our early batches this evening. And, and look, I, some people get really uh, wound up about, you know, their corks breaking and as though it's, you know, um, going to have destroyed the whiskey like it potentially may have in a, in a, in a bottle of wine. But um, it's, it's very rarely the case. Um, I've had bottles of whiskey that are, you know, only bottled uh, in the last sort of 18, 24 months and they've, uh, and they've been actually corked and the cork was completely intact. And on, on the other side of that, I've had corks that have fallen apart and the whiskey's been bloody fantastic. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, don't let that ever um, worry you. Um, just fish it out and, um, and see how it goes, eh? Um, so, yeah, getting on to batch um, 66. What do, we, what do we nose on this? He doesn't want to get out of there. No, but lots of, like, nice dark chocolate straight away, to be honest. Yeah, true. Dark cocoa chocolate. powder, even. Yeah, cocoa powder. And, again, the orange rind is really something that's been... Um, throughout the batches is, is that, that citrus and yeah. Let's um, see what. Oh, Lachlan with uh, pumpernickel bread and raspberry jam. Mm. Can always count on you for the for the out there tasting notes. I love it. The palate's back to that. Rocky Road, yes. Yeah, Rocky Road. Rocky Road, Sam with the tasting notes tonight. You're all over it. The palate's really gone back to that more of the. Um, the whiny 
um, character on this on this one. We do get that sort of fresh um, red grapes and um, almost uh, like if you'd done a compote, a berry compote um, oh, yeah. character to it. Yeah, and uh, still the the intensity um, of, of the uh, the oak, I think, is is still there, which is really remarkable. Um, I'd be interested to know um, what the size of the casks is and how that's um, how that's changed over the decades. Perhaps that's a way that they've been able to maintain quality and um, maintain the the, um, the turnover of this product and mm. the availability of this product as well. Is that you know, in, in when we did batch six, perhaps we were using um, butts, five hundred liter sherry butts. And now um, we've gone to um, Sherry Hogshead. It just says um, Sherry Hogsheads uh, will be uh, 225 uh, to 250 litres. Um, so they'll mature a lot faster and a lot more intensely um, in those smaller casks. Um, you know, even, even batch six, it, it, uh, it says um, straight from the cask at 59.9%. It doesn't actually say about the Oloroso Sherry casks. Uh, until we get to, until we get right into batch 39, does it start saying Spanish Oloroso Sherry butts? Okay, Ooh, that's interesting. Right. And then, uh, no, it still says butts on, uh, on our more recent bottling as well. So there you go. That's answered my question. It's, uh, it sounds like it's always been butts and still is. So, that's awesome. Butts. Yeah. <laughs> butts, butts, butts. <laughs> Banana bread, raspberry jam, blood plums, raspberry coolie, uh, mm. dark chocolate. Jammy dodges. Jammy dodges. Good Fantastic. Stuff. And yes, Alex, a great idea to keep spare corks, that's for sure. Mm. <laughs> Indeed. I, I still think the, um, the oakiness is really... Um, consistent all the way throughout all of these, you know, the, the, the level of, of spice, um, spice that's it. Has, has just been, yeah, right up there and, and really like properly classy throughout the, the whole lot, hasn't it? What's so fascinating is how like differently it is, it has landed on your palate each time, like from, you know, tasting batch six where we were like, whoa, that spice at the back, that hole in the middle. Mm. And now, like, you know, we do have these kind of, it's, we're finding it a little bit harder to get tasting notes to jump out of the glass at us. And we might feel a little bit more of that ethanol. But you, we've said it before during this tasting, but that balance, it really has, really has come out. So the question remains about how long will this bottling be able to remain current for? Ooh. You know, if it, and be able to keep tantalising whiskey lovers, you know, as as the sherry bomb. Um, you know, peated whiskies are becoming more and more popular um, and sherry cask whiskies are becoming more and more difficult to procure. Um, Graham and, and I were talking, Graham um, from the Odd Whiskey Koi and I were talking before about, about the way that um, casks um, in independent bottlings now are becoming more and more difficult to procure from varying distilleries and varying casks. Everything has a finish on it. Everything's been transferred um, into different casts, um, and it, it uh, yeah, it, it, it goes to show that people are wanting their whiskies to be updated and and changed and challenging all the time. And I wonder how long that this whiskey will be able to remain challenging. For. It's, fu it, it's funny you should say that because I I, I, I I was on a rumor. I think it was last year when. They, they released another a no age statement, Abala, and I heard one guy saying that's the end of Abana, the, the, or Abuna. They're, they're actually getting rid of it. So, but they they're still persisting. I, I did hear a uh, a rumor about about uh, the demise of Abana as well. Um, however, uh, so that's all right. So it's not my dotage that's um, getting in the way. Yeah. To, <laughs> to which I uh, I hurriedly bought a case and yeah. and. Uh, really eventuated so we just going. yeah we just used it and uh, and kept going and uh, and the batches have kept going so you know by the um, way just a really quick side note here tina has let us know that batch seven says butts on the box oh it does it it does great oh, if you've still got batch zero, the you know batch zero there let us know what it says on the box if it says butts 
Oh, hang on, let me check. Gee, it shows you. Uh, no, yeah, well, we can have a chat while I have a look. Uh, is there a correlation between longevity as an archetype bottling and fewer label changes? Dot, dot, like yeah, oh, 100%. You, you, you're so right there. I, I have to uh, agree with that. Like changing your label all the time. Um, hey, uh, can I just uh, pop in, just having a look at this old, um, uh, old box of mine? Uh, they got on the back of the box. It's a boonak. Huh? A-K-H <laughs> A-K is the last three words on it. Oh, wow. Typo, typo. Yeah. Um, Say anything about the cast size? No, it doesn't. Oh, well. Tina's got batch seven at butts. There you go. There you go. Good. What were we talking about? We were... um, archetypes. Cigarette, cigarette butts. <laughs> No, we were talking about um, how 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 labelling um, and the the lesser the change, the um, the more sort of um, profound and long and long long lasting the, um, the relationship is between customers and uh, and bottles that they love. Um, I suppose um, Ben Romick's been a really interesting one from that um, perspective. That you know when they did a complete backflip recently and. Um, and drops the uh, drops the current bottle shape even, yeah. um, and and completely reworked the uh, the logo and the, the lettering on it. Um, people were shocked now, and uh, you know, I have to say that the fifteen year old, which I thought was absolutely delicious, so good. Um, I look at the bottle now and go, "Are you going to be as delicious now?" I'm just not sure uh, whether it will be. And 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 same 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 went with um, the new Abelara Bruna. Bottlings. I'm sure that's why the rumor went round that they were not going to be making it anymore. They were just waiting for all the uh, the previous labels to be consumed before they released a new one. Mm. Um, it would have been as easy as that. Um, that's what Ben Riet's doing. And like, no, it's a real shame that uh, you you missed. Um, I remember that was uh, about four or five years ago. There was a really lot of pale abanax coming out, yeah. which was really interesting. Yeah. Um, so John's mentioned that the Whiskey Club has announced their next month's release is the Abana, Abana, Abana Alba. Um, could this be the end of the Abana or the start of something different altogether? Yeah, really good point. Great uh, point. What an amazing um, opportunity for, uh, for the Whiskey Club to, yeah. be, to be bottling a whole batch of Abuna. Um, um, they did put out an Alba, didn't they, recently? But, but it wasn't Abana, it wasn't cast strength, was it? No, I think it was no. just like one of their earlier age statements and it was called Alba, yeah. But it goes to show what they've got resting at the moment. Yeah, well, Alba is also the uh, the name of uh, American Oak. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, really sort of giving away, I suppose, what, what type of oak they're using. Mm. Um, mm, interesting stuff. And, yeah, um, by the way, Alex, feel free to, to jump in if you want to continue that discussion from before. But I will just quickly say that we have uh, come to the end of the formal portion of our tasting tonight, if it ever really was. We've tasted all of our whiskeys. All the information is out there. So if you've got kids you need to get to bed or, or anything of the sorts, then you can feel free to, to jump off now and, and say goodbye. And I just want to say thank you very much for joining us tonight. But we're going to continue kicking around and finishing our whiskeys, doing a little bit of a, the most expensive Pepsi challenge side by side. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. The expensive Pepsi challenge. <laughs> that wasn't me. I stole that phrase from Nick Edwards. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to duck back to um to batch 6 now because I just absolutely love going back to the beginning and seeing whether I get the same sort of appeal and whether whether my my taste buds have changed or mm. It's still so jammy. It's so incredible. And thanks to those that are on their way out. Thanks to everyone. Before everyone takes off, just massive thanks to Whiskey and Almond, uh, and this time Gray, Wright, and Paul as well for making the bottles available because, man, these side by sides can't be easy to coordinate given the length of time between bottlings um, and the amount of time you have to have stock on shelf. Um, so thanks very much, guys. Awesome tasting. Thanks for continuing to support. And yeah, I just want to echo that massive thank you to Paul Stapleton. Yeah, and Paul, you really should have chipped in, sitting there not saying anything. <laughs> yeah. uh, you're just getting out of this. I chip. thought Paul was gonna. I thought Paul was gonna.
pipe up when Jules referred to someone else as the world's biggest star bag collector. Yeah, right, exactly yeah. right. <laughs> Didn't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest hard bag collector. I've got a few, but hard <laughs> <laughs> bag tasting next month. <laughs> hey, I'm there. <laughs> you can do it, Paul. You can do it. <laughs> uh, we, we, we get first dips to the tickets. <laughs> um, so yeah, I tried that one once. Oh, oh, what you, yeah. hold, Alex Carter's holding up um, a Abelau. Uh, uh, distillery only bottling is that one of the sherry cast ones you've got there, Alex? Ah, uh, yeah, it's a first fill sherry, but 20 year old. Some of those are massively dark. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, this one's a first fill sherry, but but it's quite light for a first fill sherry, but it's low like so much beeswaxy honey sort of flavor that you often get from Abelal. Lovely, that's um, nice though. I'm uh, really uh, blown away by how tiny their little gift shop is. If anyone's oh. been in there, it's like a third of the size of whiskey and almond. And there'd be like tens of thousands of people that go through there every year. And I just find it bizarre with, out of all the space they've got in that place and they've got this time. Stuff. And one poor wee woman working work there, oh. like, you know, just like thrashing the till, trying to put it <laughs> through. It's, uh, it's pretty funny. Hey, hey Jules. So you, you've, you've tasted quite a few sh Australian sherries, yeah. whiskey. Yeah. What's your uh, comparison? Now that we've done the tasting with Abelo or Abuna. Um, to the, from the ones that I tasted today? Yeah. Um, well, I actually don't know what any of the ones we tasted were today. Uh, everything which, which is good, but, but just comparing them because you did taste Australian sherry whiskey. Right. So the biggest difference with Australian sherry matured whiskey, and a lot of distillers now in Australia are bringing in um, casks that have held Spanish sherry in them, right? So they essentially were, you know, real sherry casks. It's not a para cask. Joadja? Yeah, Joadja for one is, uh, is a really good example. Um, they bring in um, sherry casks from Spain. And um, the biggest difference I find is that the casks aren't uh, able to mature for as long in Australia because the whiskies are just so... Um, the, the, the climate's just making the whiskey move in and out of the casks so, so quickly and so aggressively that they extract everything that we get in these Abelara Boonas within a matter of three years. Yeah. And the, and the spirit um, just doesn't seem to have had enough time to integrate with the, with the wood and to break down um, as they do. And, um, and for, yeah, for spirit to really calm down enough uh, in that time is just really difficult. So that's the biggest thing that I would say um, I noticed today. Um, compared to these whiskies which we've had just now. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear how other people feel about, you know, Australian whiskies that have been matured in these Spanish casks or, or sherry casks uh, as well. Uh, Alex would probably have a couple of things to say about that, and uh, uh, particularly about the... Oh, um, sorry, just going to say a quick bite of Graham. I think you're shooting off. Yeah, got uh, need to catch up with, um, you know, some, um, some serious whiskey tasting. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, no, that that was that was absolutely marvellous. You just made my night. Really did. Thanks. Thanks. Good stuff. Great Thank you. you. All Great right. Work. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Love your work. Thank you. Cheers. Love your work. Alex, I'd love to call on you and your thoughts about, particularly about the way that um, the speed um, at which Australian whiskey matures in uh, in sherry casks and, and and striking the right balance between extraction and um, and the uh, the extraction of uh, spiritness. <laughs> For want of a better term. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I love this topic because I think a lot of this issue has been played with the idea that there's a confusion between the word ready and legally whiskey, and it's been around for a long time. Um, and that's led people to kind of look at it as just arbitrary timings, like you've got your two-year legally whiskey timing and, okay, well, it must have done everything it needs to to be whiskey by that point. Um, but in fact, you know, based on all the variables, you find it's very different. Um, I reckon that the biggest thing for Australia is, in my experience anyway, casks extract all of the spirit quality that they're probably going to uh, 
and it's still worth bottling them within about the first year um, of the residual spirit. And then after that, your risk is always the oak. Um, you could probably get different results if you could leave them for a lot longer, um, but you can't because it's going to evaporate and it's going to over oak. Um, there would be residual spirit deeper in there, but you know because you're going to be bottling them within the small small vessel size between sort of two and five, let's say, um, the the fortified or whatever the previous content that's going to be out of there pretty quickly, and then the, and then the battle is just you want to get the new make off it and all the astringency off it, and that's where the Scottish have the advantage of time, um, and at the same time you don't want it to take on the oak. Um, but it, that said, I think, you know, good fortified um, in a cask is also key to that. You know, you can't just, I think Lynn Lark said, shit in, shit out. Um, and that goes for sort of spirit and your cask quality. So if you get your ingredients right, the end product's much more likely to be good. Um, so I think, yeah, good, good fortified. And we've had the conversation about the difference between like Paxorex, the extreme example, and even down to how many times you've, sort of shaved it, reconditioned it, and still want to call it a sherry cask and all those kind of variables um, have an effect. But um, yeah, use a good fortified and don't let it over oak. Um, and also just as long as you can get it to get the new make off it would be my approach. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point you raise, the balance of astringency to oak balance with time. You're finding time, right, between how frequent and... You know, right we, we yeah. one terrible summer that is extremely hot. But I was just wondering how much of our Australian distillers are actually looking to John Paul or Kavalan or, or the tropics distillers of whiskey. Um, and, and Japan gets pretty hot to tell the truth. So if, 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 I, if I look at uh, Yamazaki in a, in a summer, it's pretty boring. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if, if there's something that, w how we compare across those like hotter climates. I think, Benson, a, a point on this too, just to finish off my point about vessel size and, and timing as well is, um, I think Australia just needs to very rapidly move to bigger vessel size, which is strange coming from me who, you know, is a small cask, that's my USP. Um, but the intention of that was always that that would be the thing that the distilleries would stop doing immediately. Um, and, you know, it's up to the independent bottlers or the very infrequent special releases to keep doing those cool little micro cask experiments and rich maturations. But I think the quicker that Australian distilleries can move to 200 litre more Sullivan's model, demystify mm. that, yep. then you're looking at the more Cavallan style of, I mean, that's the difference basically, mate, I think is all yeah, those places huge. have a relatively similar climatic situation, but they just use big format, nor well, normal format casks. Um, sure, they house. lose a lot, but it was, it was good timing. I said, done exactly the same thing as you started saying that in the chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, well, that, well yeah, essentially, you've got more on, volume to control, right? Because there, there's less fluctuations and the, the, the changes are, are less dramatic. That's it. And if you're looking at, I mean, one other change is which I think it's going to have to happen sooner rather than later. I mean, Alex, your point in the chat. Is, is super right um, and linked to this issue of timing as well because the reason that the small vessel casks have become this distillery staple is because you can get product out earlier. Well, in theory you can, which again is dispute, I dispute that, but um, you probably shouldn't be, but in a lot of cases you think you can. And so if you're a new distillery, we've seen a massive boon, um, then you, you know, that's the format you use to start off. Um, but the established guys, I think, can certainly be moving to bigger. And then to your point, Benson, you can then sort of iron out um, problems with the batching. If you're a distillery, people want a bit more consistency. Um, big formats one way, and the other way is to, once you're established, mm. stop using single cast releases. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but having said that, I'm, I'm a fan of Carveline. And if I go look at their Ola Rochros, which is at their initial first range of uh, soloist um, shared whiskies, their batches are so yep. different. Like you could almost do the same same tasting. Uh, you know, maybe Whisk and Emma can do one. Uh, but if you just compare, you know, across you know, even the five years of Solowas, Olorosos, yep. Pavlan, they're so different. Yep. And this is where I think, I'll stop talking soon, but I think 
people like uh, the big difference for established distilleries is having super good human assets um, who can do the kind of, you know, dig right down into the differences between casks. And I'll like, I mean, I'll name her. Like I think Heather Tillett at Sullivan's is one of the best at being able to make a single cask release feel like it's a, it's a blended consistent release. Um, and there's a bit of variation, but, you know, still focusing on single cast releases for an established larger output distillery is pretty impressive if you can get them more similar. I mean, that's a Kabbalan thing too. You know, they, there is variation, but a bit like the Abuna conversation, there yeah, is a there is a DNA and a consistency yep. between them. Um, whereas what you don't want is a product from a distillery that's got a well-known name that suddenly has huge batch-to-batch -batch variation in a core product. Yeah, you also yeah, don't get that no one that. Over, like that really raw um, whiny cask influence that Aussie whiskey so often has from Kavalan. Like it's it tastes more like whiskey. You know, you can taste you can taste the spirit more than so many Aussies are just full on cask influence. They taste like you know a little bit of that sherry cask straight into the whiskey, and it's young, or it's raw. Yep, it's a little tannic. It's, it's stringent. It can be yeah. nice, but it's not. It's not necessarily. Um, really whisk like you, you can't notice the more subtleties of the oak yeah the balance is totally off sort of yeah yeah so I, I put a bit of cash flow i think to be honest and that's a reality of australia driven by cash flow so, I you know. yeah well, i think, yeah. I, don't think it is I think Jules was going to say i think yeah so i was going to say that i think that um one of the things that these perhaps could work with um, actually, there's two things that they could work with. Um, is is the, uh, the, the 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 percentage they fill their casks at? So um, we know that alcohol has incredible solvent qualities. So you know, filling a cask at 63.5 percent, the way that you do in a cold climate like Scotland, perhaps you know might need revising um, and revising down and and and, um, and and filling the casks into the mid 50s um, rather than into the mid 60s. Um, in percentage of alcohol and that might you know slow the um the rate in, at which that we um we break apart those tannins in the in the wood um another another thing that i'd also think that you know and i've noticed has worked really well for australian distillers has been um these casks that might cost a little bit more um but but really um help build mid palate and body of a of a whiskey it, are these casks that have been um, given a really long um, toasting and a really intense toasting. And that's something that Kavalan do actually as well. They, they have these incredible machines that, that toast each individual cask on its own, but something like two hours mm. at like 700 degrees, um, which is not a, some, a, the, the temperature to burn the tip or make it black. It simply just toasts it from the inside out. Um, and, and then they do the char on top of that as sort of like, you know, cracking the cracking the shell if you want um, to to allow it out quickly, and I think that that's really those robots are incredible, says Brand. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I was at the distillery a couple of times, and to see the assembly line of casts going through the robots, it's very impressive. Yeah, it's amazing stuff, and I think that um, for, for instance, um, Starwood Fortis um, really catches that that toasted oak. Um, just beautifully um, and I, I did get a couple of examples of that today in, in some of the samples that we went through in the judging and, uh, you know th th those were things that really um, grabbed my attention a lot yeah um, if you want a uh, if you want a contrast I'll actually I'll throw to Sam Riccardi on this because the the Aussie thing and the point Benson you've been making on you know um, the and Alex made the same point on humidity and uh, climatic effect on the casks. The, the best contrast would be to put get the same sort of cast type, um, same age spirit, and put a McHenry's next to a something else. Because um, Sam can talk more about this, but McHenry's is the one where the anomaly because uh, it, it does a yeah, more I, Scottish I, I, I style maturation. That. So that yeah, I read that. Yeah, that's a fun fun um, side by side comparison. Because then just that's where someone said it before. I've forgotten who. Sorry, but you know that's where the spirit. Um, then the, I mean, another point is potentially does there need to be a bigger focus on Tassie Australian spirit um, and less focus on cask? Because one of the things that's defined Oz for so long, I've had a few convos with Luke McCarthy about this for you know for a long time has been the casks have dominated the 
the drink, um, it's been their thing, um, which has been a lot to do with that rapid maturation and the need to get stuff out of cask. Um, but I guess, Sam, you can talk more to how McHenry's doesn't have that issue. Yeah, we've got a fair few of both like Australian fortified and Spanish and Portuguese port. So I think the European oak works better than what the Australian stuff is, but that's just sort of the climate we're in. So I think it depends. Like our stuff's only like six to seven years old, so we don't really know what it's going to be like yet. It's not where we're ready to release it. So it's an interesting comparison though to say where it's the smaller cask and it's quicker maturation. Do you reckon, Sam, just as a, I know you've said, yeah, you haven't even got to the point where you probably want to put out all that, like some of it's still going. Um, but do you reckon that you would get most of the, the spirit sort of quality coming through after a bit of time in the cask or does that generally drop off because obviously it starts um, to oak and the fortified comes through and i think from being able to like taste in the bond store the stuff that's like zero to three we wouldn't it's not it's weird like that's the best way to describe it it's just not ready so i think from what we're seeing now once it hits past five and now we're having like past nine that's when you start to see those really cool interactions between spirit and cask and mm, not yep. one takes over, which is quite nice. And I find what Sam, I think, I think that's rare for Australian distillers. Like I've never really heard that as, as the, the regular, like if, if even if I, if I speak to, um, you know, local ones in Victoria, that not, not like Star Ward, uh, for instance, they, they wouldn't be, you know, no way they could put anything into nine years. I think, yeah, it's interesting. And, I think because we fill, I think the minimum cast we'll fill now is 200. So nothing will ever go into smaller than that. So I think that's got a bit of a part. And we're just lucky that we've sort of lucked out on a pretty, in, I think that's the best way to describe it. We've lucked out on a pretty weird patch of just environment. Like it's cold, it's wet, it's got high humidity. It's, I think it's that pure love. Of Sam, eh? So you're not stuck in like high humidity, you know, so you're getting like very, very yeah. dry kind of hot summers as well. You've got that really consistent humidity in your store down there as well. Yeah. Yeah. We hit 23 last that's, year during summer. That, it was oh, a big deal. That's the thing, man. Like, we, we've tried some, Alex, um, some hot boxing or whatever, like duck it and have a name for it, I'm sure. But, you know, like box, not, yeah. not in a vat, but in a cask and just putting it in more direct sun or putting it in the coolest spot, moving them around. And, man, that, that's a huge Australian Tasmanian um, variable that I'm sure the other, like to Benson's point about, um, I guess you could get it in a warehouse, but you know, like places like India or Taiwan, um, you, you get like 40 degrees in the day and, and negatives overnight within a 48 hour period. Yeah. Um, yeah. So putting them in like direct heat, you, you warp them and like it's, it's like three years of maturation over a summer if you do it, if but you play with that. The, the, the guys at Carvalon, though, they, they've got a, f a four-story storehouse. So they would put that, the, the stuff that needs an like acceleration up to the top level and things they want to slow down at, at the bottom level, which is almost like a basement temperature. So yeah, yeah. they've got huge control. So what do you, what do you guys yeah. make of like the part filling of casks? Like I know there's a few slosh casks. I'm not going to say who's doing slosh casks, but you can all read between the lines. What, what, what do you, what's, your, what's your take on that? Because I'm, I don't know what to make of that when I see that being sort of advertised as a quality of some of the releases at the moment. I, I reckon it's cool because it's an innovation. Um, and the uh, I'm not, I actually can't criticise it because all the ones I've tried are brilliant. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't that's, 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 I, I actually just don't know. Like, it's just, it's a, yeah, a, I want to be able to say yeah. there's a problem with it because it's kind of... But yeah, no, I mean, I, I, the only thing I can think of would be um, it, you, you presumably either be doing that for a really special release and watching it every day, sloshing it around and checking it, or you'd be trying to create a super intense Colour. product for batting um, that you'd want to bat into something to mellow out a particular quality. And in that case, power to it as a sort of a, a natural additive, I guess, um, that you can still call single malt. But yeah, no, it's... Um, it's it's fun because I reckon it won't be long till we see machines set up to just do that half fill a cask and then the machine is des designed to rotate them every day. Yeah. yeah. yeah time, it? We've got a couple of people that are just uh, trailing off and saying goodbye now and we have reached 8.45. So this is the conclusion of the event. I would say a massive thank you 
done. This is what we want out of this. We want us to be able to reconnect, and be able to talk to each other as if we were, you know, maybe sitting at, at, a, at a weird screen lit bar again. <laughs> So a big thanks to you all for getting involved and, and for keeping the conversation going because we really do love to see that. And uh, Jules, have you got any final words? Yeah, look, um, th thank you so much for, um, for for being part of this tasting and uh, for getting excited about it like uh, like I did uh, when uh, when I saw the uh, the lineup sort of taking shape. Uh, I thought, geez, I hope everyone else is going to you know, see the value in this. And um, but look, I think um, you know the, it's thrown itself in the uh, in the whiskey we tried today. So. Um, I, I hope that it was a, a nice trip down memory lane, a nice um, sort of retrospective and uh, the ultimate Pepsi challenge as well. So um, thanks so much, everyone, for uh, enjoying and, and for your comments and for your feedback. Uh, thank you again to Paul for uh, helping us with some of the bottles. And, um, and uh, thanks, Miranda, for uh, keeping us ticking along as always. My absolute pleasure. And hey, it's a... Piers, we've got a couple of first first timers tonight. So thanks so much for joining us for the first time. I hope that you didn't get uh, put off by our you know, extremely geeky community here. We all love whiskey very much. We hope that you join us again soon. Um, and we'll see, we'll see you guys at the blind tasting. See you there, Benson. And thanks again to everybody. Thanks Bye. guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. See you later. Good night, coaches. And thanks once again. Well, cheers. Can Thank I you. Go? See you guys. We should go for this one. Yeah. Appreciate it.